As humans, we've been vertebrates for around 520 million years, and for about 90% of this time we've been terrestrial. We are deeply out of our element in water, more so than in any other environment on Earth, and this vulnerability represents one extreme end of a spectrum. And at the opposite end of this spectrum sits the perfect marine predator. There's something very tempting about the idea of sea monsters. It's why so many sailors came up with legends of them. We're drawn to these legends of the ocean more than any other kind, and our imaginations will happily run wild on just the smallest hint of suggestion. But there's something more tempting still about sea monsters that actually existed, and Britain is one of the best places in the world to explore these. What was once a tropical archipelago is now the cold, sedimentary resting place of one such legend, 160 million years in the making, a legend that would rise and fall twice. This was the legend of a 25-meter, hypercarnivorous marine behemoth with a hankering for children and megalodon sharks. But this is also the story of how Liapleurodon rose and fell, first in the warm tropical waters of Jurassic Europe and then again in the fickle yet stubborn fiction of our own nightmares. And this story begins with bricks. In the 19th century, most British bricks were mined from a layer of sediment known as Oxford clay. These bricks dominated the market and they were used for a huge proportion of the buildings in the country, forming up to five million British homes and supporting much of the infrastructure in cities like London and Oxford. Oxford clay is formed from huge deposits of Jurassic sediment, from a time when much of Britain was broken up by warm seas. While monsters were patrolling these waters, this sediment was slowly building up for millions of years, getting pocked with organic matter from all of the marine life that would die and then sink into the mud. During this period, it would have been possible to swim all the way from Dover to Oxfordshire, and 160 million years before the M25 was built around London, it probably didn't take that long either. Today, that journey is all above land, but the sediment of millions of years of sea life tells an ancient story and it's this quantity of organic matter spotted through the clay that is exactly what made these bricks so easy to burn and cheap to produce. London and Oxford have a long and sordid history, with the two cities exchanging, among other things, strong words, exiled queens, and cannon fire over the years. But they have far more history in common than they might realize. Many of the buildings in both cities are held aloft by these characteristic yellow stock bricks, including 10 Downing Street in London, where in 1997 the new tenant, Tony Blair, would be living when he facilitated Britain's return to UNESCO. Four years later, UNESCO would declare a portion of this Jurassic sediment, an area where the ocean meets the land, a World Heritage Site, forever protecting a prolific hotspot for fossils and any number of undiscovered prehistoric legends that have yet to reveal themselves. And it was in this sediment, that the early rumblings of a legendary sea monster were experienced. The first fossils of this beast were likely found in 1838 in Switzerland, and they were large, curved and conical teeth, but nobody knew what these were back then. In 1852, another large tooth was found in Germany, and in 1860, yet another set in the Moscow Basin. It seemed a very large predatory reptile had been dropping teeth all over Europe, mostly in England and France, as we discover, but its identity remained a mystery. Paleontologists at the University of Oxford started paying workers at the clay pits to pause work when they found fossils, so that their teams could extract them themselves. More teeth were found in Peterborough in England, and 17 vertebrae from the very Oxford clay formation that was being mined to build so many of these homes. In 1873, we finally got a name, Liopleurodon. Eventually, parts of skull and postcranial skeleton fragments were added to the collection. In France, the so-called Toisse specimen was dug up in 1979, and this would play an important role further down the line in dispelling myths about this animal. By this time, multiple Lyopleurodon species had been described, but these were collapsed in 2001 when it was put forward that there can be only one, Lyopleurodon ferox, the ferocious Lyopleurodon. We owe the genus name to the French paleontologist Henri-Emile Sauvage, but we also owe him some of this animal's legendary status, as he described it in his initial report as having attained completely gigantic proportions. 
And it was with this inch that the BBC apparently took a mile in 1999 when they depicted an animal of 25 metres in length and 150 tonnes in weight. Our imaginations could now entertain themselves with dreams of sea monsters that actually existed. They may not have been alive now, but they were at least real in the tangible sense, and researchers were finally piecing together what this thing may have looked like. We had a body type, a large, thick head sitting on a robust and short neck, followed by a huge trunk and two large flippers. It would later be found to have had a tail fluke. Robot modelling has suggested that this would have been a powerful ambush predator, and it was probably opportunistic. Remains of cephalopods have been found inside Liopleurodon remains, though it's not yet clear whether these were cephalopods who were eaten directly or had been eaten by some other animal that was subsequently eaten by Liopleurodon. In the BBC production, this intimidating spectacle was seen leaping out of the water, making very short work of a Eustreptospondylus, a 6-metre, 300-kilogram theropod. But all the fossils that were documented of Liopleurodon were very fragmented, and estimates of its size would prove to be hasty and ultimately inaccurate. As the infamous year of 2001 was drawing to a close, in Britain, a Swede had taken over the English football team, Labour had won a significant victory in a general election, and a 34-year-old would-be Prime Minister, David Cameron, held onto his seat as a Member of Parliament for Whitney in Oxfordshire. Whitney is a beautiful old market town, nestled among rolling hills and picturesque valleys at the edge of the Cotswolds, an area that was once inhabited by Iron Age people, at least as far back as 2,700 years ago. This town is home to some tales of knights being turned into stone and ghosts of 11th century priests floating in the river. The name Whitney comes from the Old English for Witter's Island, but around 160 million years before David Cameron, and indeed whoever Witter was, it was well and truly underwater. While the belief in 11th century ghosts has all but dried up now, the legend of Liopleurodon from the hidden sea beneath the town continues. 2001 rolled into 2002, and The Land Before Time brought out its ninth iteration of its iconic dinosaur series, featuring the now infamous sea monster as an antagonist, which they called the Sharp-Toothed Swimmer. Liopleurodon legends had finally made it into the public consciousness. It wouldn't be until 2005 that cracks began to appear in the status of Liopleurodon, but even then they were slow to spread. The first hints that Liopleurodon wasn't quite what we thought it was may have come just six years after walking with dinosaurs from a lethargic cartoon unicorn called Charlie, whose critical attitude towards the so-called magical Liopleurodon not only increased its popularity, but also pointed at it as being overhyped and entirely unfit to direct anyone, let alone unicorns, to Candy Mountain. But Charlie and his annoying companions only briefly touched on the mythical status of Liopleurodon, and this was not enough to deter our imaginations. We'd been given a real sea monster, and we weren't about to give it back. In 2006, the French Toisset specimen was presented to the public in Tois during a short exhibition for the European Heritage Days and the Science Festival. It remains one of the most complete skeletons of this animal currently recorded. Yet, to say it isn't 25 metres long underplays it somewhat. This specimen is about 3.2 metres long. Granted, it doesn't have a head, but unless it was lugging around a skull seven times its body length, the evidence for a much smaller maximum size was piling up. By this time, the scientific community had accepted that Liopleurodon estimates were way overblown, and the consultant for the Walking with Dinosaurs depiction, Professor David Martill, admitted himself, I hold my hands up. I got the size of Liopleurodon horrendously wrong. Martil had been extrapolating from a single vertebra, which at the time was thought to have been from a juvenile. And in his defense, he ended up being one of the people responsible for the more realistic understanding of this animal that we have now. But the legend of Liopleurodon wouldn't be that easy to stop. Even today, popular media has spouting headlines such as Liopleurodons that once swam the Jurassic Seas were over 80 feet long. Despite providing nothing to back this up with, and while the legend of the Liopleurodon may take some time to die, the animal itself went extinct a long time before the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary, and nobody's quite sure why. This is perhaps fitting for an animal so shrouded in mystery and speculation, 
But whether we see it or not, Liopleurodon, along with any number of countless forgotten giants, lives on in the very material that was used to build over five million British homes, and there may yet be hope for our imaginations. Much like the cities in Oxfordshire, London has been the site of many dubious stories over the eons, from myths painted on the side of buses all the way through vampires in Highgate Cemetery and the legend of spring Hill Jack and David Bowie. But as we've seen, British legends go back much further than this and can even be found in the earth that the cities stand on. Unlike Whitney and Oxford, London sits on a much more recent deposit, this time Cretaceous sediment, and this layer conceals its own secrets. Much like the Jurassic coasts, the Cretaceous sediment that covers much of southeast England is throwing up hints of prehistoric monsters. Lyopleurodon was a pliosaur, and pliosaurs by the Cretaceous were mostly usurped by a new generation of monstrous predator, the Mosasaurs. But much like Lyopleurodon fossils, Mosasaur fossils in Britain are scarce and fragmented, and this leaves plenty of opportunity for speculation. Mosasaurs are now replacing Lyopleurodon in our imaginations, just as they once did in the prehistoric oceans. But if there are any lessons to be learned about the legend of Lyopleurodon, it's that jumping to conclusions can end in disappointment. So we'll leave you with a couple of British finds that are undeniable. Before we do, we just want to say thanks for watching and remind you that you can support us directly simply by liking this video and if you want to catch the next one, hitting subscribe as well. Now, as far as British sea monsters go, there likely aren't any more mesmerizing than the colossal head of the monster marine predator found in the southwest within the UNESCO heritage site, the Jurassic Coast. Pliosaurus cavani was found in 1970 and it is an incredibly complete skull of a relative of Lyopleurodon, likely significantly larger. But this exceptional beast was still only around 10, perhaps 12 meters long. So to really scratch the itch, we have to go deeper. This time to the Triassic, and finally, we have our 25 meter blue whale-sized sea monster. This time it's a dolphin-shaped ichthyosaur, and perhaps the largest marine reptile of all time. But beware, legends take a moment to form but can last forever. The remains of this monstrosity are still limited to a couple of pieces of jawbone, but if early estimates are anywhere near accurate, they may have been a Goliath marine hunter, three times the size of Lyopleurodon, patrolling the waters 50 million years before the legendary Pliosaur even existed. That's all for now. See you next time.